faith, brothers and sisters, is mainly a falling in love with the reward, with God, with all that He promises to be for us in Jesus, so that bridges are burned in our heart between God and sin. So that when crises come in our lives and the emotions of fear and all kinds of stress just threaten to take us over and we look back to safety, the bridge is burned. It's gone. There's no turning back. Stress is the kind of thing that when you feel it and you're getting knotted up inside, it's hard to get your bearings to live a life of risk-taking love. In this episode of Light and Truth, John Piper opens Hebrews 11, 23 to 28 to show how to handle crisis and stress by faith. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on August 3rd, 1997. Now, the situation you remember is that the king of Egypt became fearful that there were so many baby boys being born to the Jews and the numbers were great and these were good workers and who knows what might happen if they became too many. And so he said, kill the boys, leave the girls alone. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, it says, Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every Jewish son who is born, you shall cast into the Nile, and every daughter you shall leave alive. Now notice, there are two threats here, not just one. This is very crucial, because if you see only one threat, you won't understand this verse. It's a very perplexing verse in one sense, verse 23. Here are the two threats. The first threat is to the children. Kill them, he says. If there's a baby boy born, make sure you find him and throw him in the Nile so that we can deplete the population here of Jewish boys. Now, that's the first threat. The second threat is implicit. This is a command from Pharaoh. And if you disobey this command, you're in big trouble. Pharaohs didn't give commands to be flaunted or ignored. Therefore, it's a threat against the parents. If you don't obey this command, you're in trouble. Okay? So you got a threat to babies, and you got a threat to parents who try to save babies. Now, that's crucial. If you don't get that, this verse will make no sense. Let's read it. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful or a goodly child. And they were not afraid of the king's edict. Now, I can imagine someone saying, well, of course they were afraid or they wouldn't have hit him. They would have just carried him around on their shoulder, nursed him in public. They're afraid. They're hiding the baby. What do you mean, verse 23, that they're not afraid of the king's edict? Now, that's the problem. Without which, you you won't have a solution for that unless you understand there are two threats in this text. There's a threat to the baby... And there's a threat to parents who save babies. So what does it mean? They hid their son because they were not afraid of the king's edict. I take it to mean that they were afraid for the baby and therefore they hid the baby. They weren't afraid for themselves, and therefore they risked their lives for the baby. That's my interpretation of this verse. That the thing they didn't fear was for themselves. There wasn't a kind of privatistic, self-seeking dependence on comfort, pleasure, safety, security mentality in 
the parents of Moses. They looked the fearful threat of Pharaoh right in the face and said to themselves, perhaps to each other, we will not be governed by the fear of this man's threat. And we will do whatever we can to save our baby. Now, the point of the text is that this courage, this risking of your life, was by faith. That's the point. By faith, Moses was hidden because they were not afraid. You get it? If you just collapse the verse down into its essential components, by faith, they risked their lives because they weren't afraid. So faith delivers from fear for your life. How does it do that? Verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Meaning, as they contemplated the danger. Now we're talking mega stress, child rearing here. As they contemplate the fact that one cry from this baby, one passing stranger, and not only is his throat slit or drowned, ours is, too. This is stress, folks. You don't sleep well for these three months. You get up quick when the baby does that. And that's okay. That's okay. Sorry, Laura. When that happens, you wake up and you think, we're dead. Now, how do you get the courage or the peace to even survive for three months? And the answer is, by the assurance of things hoped for. I hope you get the message of this chapter, that the way to live the Christian life is to have values to have a God, to have spiritual reality, to have heaven, to have forgiveness, to have a hope future that is so stunningly certain, so stunningly satisfying, so all need meeting that you can sleep for those three months with that little baby, knowing that at any time all of you could be killed. That's what faith is meant for. Now, that's the main point of verse 23. Now, I want to make a jump with you to verse 27 and come back to verses 24 to 26. And the reason is this. Verse 27 is more perplexing than verse 23. And its solution lies in understanding what we have just said about verse 23. Okay? So let's go to verse 27. Moses is getting very uncomfortable with his present situation in the palace of Pharaoh. He knows, you know, you know the story that he is, his mother brought him up in a most wonderful act of providence where God allowed the mother to have him even after they found him in the bulrushes. So he knows his faith. He knows he's a Jew. He knows his mother. He knows his sister. He knows his people. He knows they're being abused and beat up. And he begins to feel very bad about this. And in chapter 2 of Exodus, where the story is told, in verse 14, one day it just gets the best of him. And he's walking down the road and he sees an Egyptian slave master beating on a Jewish slave. And Moses says, It's a crisis. I believe it's a mega crisis that this author exploits to the full. Who am I? Who is my God? Who are my people? Where do I stand? On whose side am I? Where do I live? What are my values? And I hope some of you come to that crisis this morning. And he looked at that moment and something broke inside Moses that would define the rest of his life. He intervened and he killed the Egyptian. And the next day, he finds out that the word is abroad. And he's afraid. He's afraid. 
Exodus 2.14. Then Moses was afraid and said, Surely the matter has become known. And the next verse, 15 of Exodus 2, says, When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. Problem. Mega problem. You see the problem in verse 27? Is Moses afraid and leaving out of fear, or is he not? It's like asking, were his parents afraid when they hid the baby, or weren't they? Verse 27 says, By faith Moses left Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king. You got to see the parallel parallel here to verse 23. Otherwise, you're just going to take this and say this is a blatant contradiction to Exodus 2:14. Exodus 2:14 says he was afraid. Hebrews 11:27 says he left Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king. So you see the similarity between the two cases. They're not exactly the same. Moses left Egypt out of fear. Or didn't he leave Egypt out of fear? Did the parents hide the baby out of fear? Or didn't they hide the baby out of fear? Verse 23 says they didn't do it out of fear. And verse 27 says he didn't leave Egypt. Egypt out of fear. And we know in both cases that they did fear. And so you've got to make distinctions. You've got to be careful. This author is not dumb. If there's any lesson that the writer, that we should get from the writer, reading this writer to the Hebrews, is that he knows his Old Testament. I mean, this whole book is written by a masterful interpreter of the Old Testament. He was not ignorant of Exodus 2.14. He was interpreting Exodus 2.14 and preventing us from misconstruing Exodus 2.14 as though fear were the rock-bottom issue in Moses' life. And this writer knew it wasn't because he had seen something earlier. He had seen something earlier. Now, the solution with the parents is this. They were not fearing for themselves. They were risking their own lives. They were fearing for the baby and therefore they are hiding the baby. That... That's not hard to see. What about Moses? It's a little different here because he did save his life by leaving Egypt. He ran. By faith, he left Egypt. However, the verse says, not fearing the wrath of the king. What's the key? The key is in the word Endured in verse 27. Your version may have persevered. Let me read it and show you what I mean. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured. Or, for he persevered as seeing him who is unseen. In other words, this writer is saying that it wasn't basically fear that drove him out of Egypt. It was basically endurance that drove him out of Egypt. Endurance in what? Perseverance in what? We got, whenever you hear the word endure, this is an unusual word. It's not used anywhere else in the New Testament. This persevering, enduring word raises this question. When you persevere or endure, it implies you've made some choices about a path that you're on and there's some threats to get you off of it and you reject the threats and you stay on it. That's endurance, right? 
So that's what he's talking about here. When Moses heard the threats of Pharaoh, knew that his murder had been found out, this writer says it wasn't fear that caused him to go to Midian. It was endurance. Now, in what? And now we go back to verses 24 and 26. Because what this writer saw in this break in Moses' life, this crisis where he intervened and killed the Egyptian, this writer saw a stunning change midlife for Moses. So let's read it. Verse 24. This is describing the path chosen on which he endured when he left Egypt. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, that happened at some point where it broke. And it got fleshed out in that intervention in the squabble between the Egyptian and the Jew. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather... There's the chosen path. To endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking to the reward. Now there is a chosen path here. It's expressed in two ways. Number one in verse 25 He says, I choose ill treatment with the people of God over the passing pleasures of Egypt. Secondly, verse 26, I choose to be reproached for the Messiah over the inheritance of the treasures of Egypt. Now, don't miss this. This choice was made before the threat of Pharaoh to kill him. That's absolutely crucial. This choice was made, and that's why the texts are ordered the way they are. This choice was made, I embrace suffering, I embrace reproach, I reject the palace, I reject Pharaoh, I reject riches, I reject passing pleasures of sin. I am on a new course with God and with the people of God. That happened in the heart of Moses before the threat came, I'm going to kill you. Now, that's what this writer is thinking when he says, okay, like any other human being, when he hears that the Pharaoh is after him, his heart will beat faster, his palms will get sweaty, his mind will become disjointed, and he will wonder, what shall I do? This Bible writer is not denying that those things happen. What he's denying is that Moses became a selfish, self-preserving, comfort-seeking, security-grabbing person and simply got out of there to save his skin. And the reason this writer wants to assert that is because of what he saw in verses 24 and 26. That something had happened in Moses' life and therefore he said... Moses endured in this lifestyle choice that he had made. Sure, there were all kinds of emotional upheaval, just like the parents of Moses had unbelievable emotional upheavals when they were hiding their baby. But they looked that threat right in the face and said, your threat to me is not going to govern my life. Fear is not going to govern my values. Where I live, what I do for a living, how I raise my kids, I'm not going to let fear be the script writer of my life. That's what his parents said when they hid the baby. And that's what Moses said. That's the point here. They said, when Moses left Egypt, sure he was in the midst of upheaval, he didn't want to be killed, but he was driven by values that are described in verses 24 to 26 that he did not forsake wasn't any perfect man, as we'll see, as you can see in the rest of his story. But he had, he had made a choice. He had gotten on a road. Or the word that came to me as my 
in, in, the, in the language that I was pondering was, before he burned the bridges between him and Egypt, geographically, he had already burned them in his heart. That's, that's what I want you to leave with this morning. Faith, brothers and sisters, is mainly a falling in love with the reward, with God, with all that He promises to be for us in Jesus, so that bridges are burned in our heart between God and sin. So that when crises come in our lives and the emotions of fear and all kinds of stress just threaten to take us over and we look back to safety, the bridge is burnt. It's gone. There's no turning back. I do believe that at this moment Moses could have saved his life. I I ran this through my brain like this. I think Moses could have heard Pharaoh is out to get you because you killed an Egyptian. I think he should he could have gone to his stepmother, Pharaoh's daughter, and said, get me an appointment with the king. He's misunderstood. You go with me. So they walk in the presence of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's eyes are glazed. You traitor. I always knew this would happen, raising a Jew in my court. And he says, wait a minute. Listen, I know these people. You're making a stupid mistake by beating them. We'll never get the bricks we need. We never get the straw we need if you treat them like that. I know how to treat Jews. I'm a Jew. Of course I'd knock this guy off. I didn't mean to kill him, which wasn't true. But I think he would have lied. I'd knock this guy off. I didn't mean to kill him. I just meant to get him off the guy. You can't do it this way. Now give me a break. I've never let you down. I've grown up in this court. I know all the wisdom and I know how to maximize slavery from Jews. I think he could have done that real easy. Pulled it off. And he didn't do it. He kept on his course. He had burnt the bridges back to Egypt and he was out of there to see what God would do over the next 40 years. So I close with this exhortation. Let's be like Moses this morning, okay? Let's be like Moses. Let's look at the reward of God's promises. Verse 26, look at the reward of God's promises. Let's look at the God who is unseen. Verse 27, you see, Moses is doing this. He's looking away from the present circumstance to the reward and to the God who is unseen. And let's be so hungry. I hope this book will help you. Let's be so hungry for God that bridges are burned to a thousand sins in your life and a thousand fears. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our 12-part series, Risk-Taking Faith, with a sermon titled, The Miracles and Miseries of Faith. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.